Today we're going to learn a little bit about the Pabst Company. There's a lot of interesting facts to take in on this one, including at one time they actually made cheese that rivaled Velveeta. This and more on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. So our story starts with a guy named Jacob Best. He was born in 1786 in Germany. He learned the craft of brewing while he was in Germany. When Jacob was about 54, he and a few of his family members, including some of his sons, immigrated to America and they settled in Milwaukee. In 1844, at the age of 58, with two of his sons, named Lorenz and Philip, Jacob Best opened the Empire Brewery which produced lager beer, whiskey, and vinegar. Here's a photo from his actual gravestone. As demand increased for a lighter lager beer, the company changed its name to Best & Company. All four of his sons would eventually work at the brewery with their dad. When Jacob Best was approaching 70 years old, he retired in 1853, and his sons Lorenz and Philip took over the business. By 1859, just his son Philip was the sole proprietor, and he changed the name of the company to the Philip Best Brewing Company. And here's a photo that I found online. So now, Philip had two daughters. One was named Maria, and the other one was named Lisette. More about them in just a minute. Now we're going to switch gears to Frederick Pabst, who was born in Germany in 1836. Now, 12-year-old Frederick Pabst arrived in America with his parents in 1848. They settled in Chicago. Now, Fred worked as a hotel boy for $5 a month, and when his mom died, he ended up as a cabin boy on a steamboat. And before long, before he was even 21 years old, he became a captain of a steamer named Comet. He ended up being referred to as captain for the rest of his life. So fast forward to 1862. 26-year-old Frederick married Maria Best, who we just learned about. She's the daughter of Philip Best. So by the next year, Frederick is working in Milwaukee at the brewery with his father-in-law. Doesn't he just look like a modern guy? I mean, many times these old photos look old, but he looks very modern to me. Now look how regal Miss Maria looks. Get a load of that chair that she's sitting in. It doesn't it look like a throne? I mean, she is pretty. So Frederick and Maria, they end up having 12 babies together, but only five make it to adulthood. That's so sad. In 1864, a 28-year-old Frederick Pabst purchased half interest in the brewing company for $21,000, and he became vice president. Soon after this, Maria's little sister, named Lisette, She married a guy named Emile Shandine in 1866. Emile ended up buying the other half of the company. So the following year, their father-in-law, Philip Best, retired, and he left his sons-in-law to run the business. Now this is the third change of hands so far. Philip Best died a few years later in 1869. His obituary mentions that he was a major general of the Wisconsin State Militia, It also mentions that he was visiting Germany when he died, and he was buried there. Here's an 1870 look into Frederick and Maria's household. They have four children in the house, and they have seven other adults living with them. A few of them are domestic servants, but the rest of them say they're brewers. Maybe they're employees. So what ended up being a tragedy for many breweries, but ended up being a blessing for the best brewery, was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It destroyed 19 Chicago breweries, and apparently that kind of put the best brewery on the map. Pabst and Shandine both had an understanding of business and for marketing. The company became known for always embracing the latest technology in production. Artificial ice machines were added in 1880, incandescent lights were put in in 1882, And the Philip Best Brewing Company was one of the first breweries to open itself up for public tours. Their beer won gold medals at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876, and then in 1878 at the Paris World's Fair. 
So, in 1882, the company began tying blue ribbons around the neck of each bottle of its select beer to distinguish it from other brands, and customers began asking for the blue ribbon beer even before it became the official name. This ad is from around 1912, and I think the bottle in the ad looks like mine. So now let's look at the 1876 City Directory. Here's the Philip Best Brewing Company. Frederick is still president. Emil is vice president. Charles Best Jr. is secretary. So some of the Best family is still getting involved. In fact, here's a couple more that are working there. This 1880 directory is interesting. It looks like they opened a couple more locations. This says Empire Brewery, which I found a photo of, and Southside Brewery in Oregon. And come on, how cute is this? The sad one says, I drink imported. And the happy one says, I don't. I drink Philip's Best Brewing Company Milwaukee beer. <laughs> so the brothers-in-law ran the business for over 20 years together, until 1888 when Shandine died. Frederick Papps became president. He made Emile's widow, Lisette, also his sister-in-law, he made her vice president. So in 1890, Frederick Papps changed the company's name to Papps Brewing Company. Now let's update the chart. 1892, it became the largest lager brewery in the world, the first to produce over a million barrels of beer in a single year. The 1893 Chicago World's Fair had been mentioned in several of our videos on this channel. Well, apparently this company had an elaborate custom pavilion built for this event, costing over $100,000. Well, after the event, it was moved, and it apparently still survives to this day, although they say it's in pretty bad shape. But how cool is that? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Pabst also utilized national advertising campaigns. He wanted his product to be visible everywhere. Over 25 years' time, he bought several real estate properties to build Pabst taverns from coast to coast. And just to get an idea of how over-the-top these guys are, here's an 1895 article about a parade for the whole town, and Paps participated in it. Apparently, it was quite an impressive display. Their theme was Pharaoh and his queen being pulled by giant horses, and there's a play-by-play -play of the whole routine as it rolls down the street. And then it says it's followed by a thousand men carrying a Paps banner, while 300 women dressed in white, riding decorated wagons, they're passing out beer. It says it was over a mile long, and it says, quote, it was one of the most comprehensive showerings ever made by an establishment. Pabst was also very involved in the community, and he built Milwaukee's Pabst Theater and several Pabst Hotels. The theater was originally built in 1890, but it burned down in 1895, which Paps immediately rebuilt. Here's a photo inside. It still stands today, and it's still being used. Here's a few photos of the inside. Isn't it pretty cool? Here's Milwaukee's Paps Brewery Grand Resort Hotel. Paps purchased this land back in 1888, and he built his hotel on it. It was accessed by rail and by steamboat, but after about 27 years, it was demolished in 1915. According to Wikipedia, Pabst owned nine hotels in places like Chicago, New York, Minneapolis, and San Francisco. This one's in Manhattan, on the site that would later become Times Square. Now, Pabst had heart problems, diabetes, emphysema, and apparently intestinal problems. And on the day he died, he was able to speak to his family until up to 10 minutes before he passed. He ended up dying on New Year's Day in 1904. His funeral was meant to be a private affair, but it says enormous amounts of mourners surrounded the mansion and made that impossible. Now, Maria lived for only another two years, when she actually fell out of a carriage, injuring herself, and while she was in the hospital, she developed pneumonia and died. Their mansion still stands. It's a museum now. And I found some photos of the inside. I mean, I think it's everything I expected it to be. What do you think? So by the time Frederick's death, only four of his children were alive. 
two sons and two daughters. His two sons were Gustav and Frederick Jr. So Gustav and Fred Jr. take over the business. Now this is the fourth generation now. And they run it for about 20 years. During the dry season of the Prohibition, they began making cheeses. According to the website, it really thrived. They had bought some land, they started a dairy farm, and by 1930, over 8 million pounds of cheese had been sold. Kraft eventually bought out the Pabst cheese operations. Seeing Pabst et as a copycat, Kraft sued Pabst and won, although they reportedly gave the brewery a royalty-free license to keep making the cheese. Now let me just show you a couple quick recipes. Basically this one is a Velveeta type cheese mixed with eggs. You put that on toast and then it's browned in the oven. Eh, not bad I guess. Now here's one for a cheese and jelly sandwich. I guess it has potential to be good, I just don't know how the cheese tastes. The part where they really throw me off on this one is where you're supposed to spread the bread with margarine first. Eh, why? So during the Prohibition, Gustav retired. Now Fred Jr. had six sons that I found. August, Fred III, Rudolph, Robert, David, and Harold. By 1932, here's Frederick Jr. He's still president. It says his sons, Fred III, August, and Rudolph, were all vice president. This 1933 article mentions that another son, Robert, is also currently involved. So this is Generation 5 now involved. By this point, we've been in business for about 90 years. About 1935, Paps Beer starts introducing beer in cans. So now let's fast forward 20 years and Fred III retires in the 50s, and he dies in 1977. And I didn't see any more mention of the Paps family members involved with the company after this, so I don't know if they were or not. In 1954, I found an article that talks about the Paps dairy farm, so this farm would be going now for about 20 years. I don't know when it stopped. During the 70s and 80s, they kept fighting off being taken over by stockholders trying to take control of the company. Now, I don't understand how these things work, honestly, but in 1985, it says Paul Kamenowitz purchased the company in an apparent hostile takeover through his holding company. Now, he died two years later, and it changed hands a few times since then. So in 1996, the brewery closed after 150 years in operation. It sat vacant for about 10 years, and then in 2006, someone purchased it and took seven years to restore it. And then it reopened in 2013. The old Milwaukee Brewery site is now a hotel called the Brew House Inn and Suites. I'm so excited to see this restored and repurposed. It's so pretty. So my bottle is blown in a three-piece mold. It's got a tooled top, tons of bubbles. Dang, isn't that pretty? It has a simple Pabst written across it. The bottom is embossed registered. Since the name of the company wasn't Pabst until 1890, that's the earliest that we could date this one. I feel like this could fit into the 1890s through the early 1910s-ish. I found some later brown bottles and even a green example. And here's a quick date breakdown for anyone with variations out there. And that's going to do it for today. I'm going to leave you with a couple commercials, and I'm going to see you on the next one. Thanks for watching, guys. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. When a waitress glides up to your place with a pretty smile upon her face, here's the way to really romance her. Give her that Pabst Blue Ribbon answer. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Smoother, smoother, smoother flavors. Zest and sparkle, million flavors. Taste that smoother, smoother flavor. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Beer. Finest beer served anywhere. Prove it yourself. Make the three-way experts test. One, see the clear color. Look at the creamy head. Two, sniff that fragrant blue ribbon blend. Three, taste the flavor the whole world knows. And you'll agree, finest beer served anywhere. What do you have? Pabst Blue Ribbon. Pal, yes, sir. Shake hands with the Pabst Blue Ribbon Handy Six. 
Just insert your fingers in that patented, easy-to-grip handle, then you're headed for pleasure with six taste-filled cans of that smoother, smoother, smoother Pabst Blue Ribbon. Finest beer served anywhere. So when your dealer says, what do you have? Well, just tell him you want six cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon in the Handy Six.